John chapter 20, and let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this morning. What a powerful portion of scripture, God, as we see you today rise from the dead. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for what you've done through the teaching of your word and what you've done through the cross and what you've done through the grave. And Lord, the fact that the grave is now empty means we don't have to leave here today empty, but we can be filled with you, Lord. That is those of us who know you, we can be refreshed, we can be restored and filled. And those in here that don't know you can meet you for the first time. You're an amazing God and I expect you to do amazing things. And so Lord, open your word to us, be the teacher today and let us be filled with your joy as we seek you, Lord, in your word and by your spirit. So teach us now, Lord, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, as we look at the resurrection this week, last week, remember, we saw the crucifixion. And so today we're going to see the resurrection. We're not going to get as far as I wanted to. I don't think so today. I wanted to go all the way through 18, but there's so much information. We'll take up wherever we stop today and go from there next time um, and finish the looking at the resurrection because there's so much in this story that we need to look at. But while we all celebrate the crucifixion, and the payment for our sins, which we should, without the resurrection, it would not have been complete. And let me explain that. The reason being, we would all be forgiven, but without the resurrection, death would not be defeated, meaning this, we wouldn't face eternal judgment, which is a great thing, but also meaning we wouldn't be eternal. I mean, think about it. I I'm glad that he died for me on the cross because that means I will never be judged. But what if that was it? I live this life, I die and it's over and I'm glad there's no judgment, but I just stop. That's not how it works. The Bible said we live forever. We're eternal beings. So the good news is he rose from the dead and everyone that believes in him will rise eternally to be in the kingdom of God as well. So understand the resurrection, uh, they're both exciting uh, when you look at them theologically and the resurrection, again, almost more exciting in the fact you don't see the Lord suffer, but the bottom line is both of them are necessary for what had to happen for us to be not only forgiven, but to inherit the kingdom of God. Um, you know, the cross without the resurrection is like restoring something like an old car or an old engine, but never putting gas in it. You know, you look at it, isn't that beautiful, but it's, it has no purpose, it's still dead. So the resurrection, the death on the cross, yes, it pays for sins. The resurrection is what gives life eternally as we have to live with the Lord forever. Now. Again, there's a lot to cover, so we're going to jump right into it. Uh, again, I, my notes went way longer than I thought they were going to go. That's why I didn't think we'd finish. So today we're going to go about four hours. So I want you to be ready and be... Okay, I'm just kidding. But anyway, we, do, we will have to take a couple weeks to finish this. But let's jump right in and uh, uh, we'll see where we get to today. Notice verse 1. It says, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early. Note that. While it was still dark. And she saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Now, again, it's early Sunday morning before the sun is risen. And Mary Magdalene is going to the tomb to finish the job of preparing and anointing the body of Jesus because it was so rushed three days earlier. Remember, they had to get him done and in the grave before the sun went down because of the Sabbath and Passover week. And to her surprise, she sees the stone has been rolled away. Now, it's interesting. It says that Mary and the other women, they went at different times. But Mary now was the first one to go, and Mary is taking with her this ointment. She wants to go and finish anointing the body of the Lord. And I'd never thought about that until this week, but I'm thinking, what is Mary going to anoint? I mean, he's already been wrapped. He's completely wrapped in linen. They've put him in the grave. The only thing that wasn't covered on Jesus at this point and already wrapped in all these ointments was his face. They left the face open in the Jewish burial and they would put the handkerchief around the head and cover the face. That's how they did it. Which means Mary probably was simply going to love on the face of the Lord Jesus. What a beautiful picture that is for us this morning. Just to love on the face of the Lord Jesus, to, to, sit, to put more ointment on the wounds, to look at his face, to weep over him, to cry, all the things that were going because she didn't know he was going to resurrect. But what does the Bible say? The Lord said, seek my face. That's kind of an odd saying in our language, right? Seek my face. You don't typically say that to a friend, right? Hey, let's get together. Seek my face. I'll see you at lunch. You know, that just doesn't work. But with the Lord, he means seek who I am, my goodness, my countenance, all that I am, I want you to seek. Mary is going to seek literally the face of the Lord because she's in love with him. And one of the things I want you to really grasp this morning is not just the resurrection, which is the main reason, uh, the main thing we look at and that we're excited about in this particular passage, but guys, don't miss the love of Mary. That plays a huge role. Mary Magdalene, it plays a huge role in this. Remember, Mary was the one that had seven demons cast out of her. Now, I don't think I was ever demon-possessed. I mean, 
At least I never foamed at the mouth, you know, um, on purpose anyway. But the bottom line is, I don't know if it was, you know, demonic or whatever, but the bottom line is the demons were there, they were cast out. And the Bible says those who are forgiven much love much. Mary loved what the Lord had done for her. She was, she was thankful to the Lord. She devoted everything to the Lord. And so much so, and this is interesting, because she goes to the, the tomb early in the morning, again, bringing this ointment, no doubt, to anoint his face and to gaze on him maybe one last time before uh, she's done and before his body begins to decay or whatever the case might be. But notice to her surprise, she notices the stone, the huge stone that was there um, that had covered the grave. Uh, they put the stone in front of them. There were giant stones, but it says it had been taken away. Mary sees the stone has been taken away. And again, it's quite shocking when she sees that. But what's even funnier to me is that Mary was going to the tomb knowing that the stone was there, not knowing the stone had been rolled away. And who would have rolled away the stone? And she didn't care. This is the love Mary had for Jesus. I'm going to get to Jesus regardless of the obstacles. I don't care if there's a stone in the way. I don't care what's in the way. I don't care how early it is. I don't care what I'm doing. I'm getting to Jesus and her love is amazing. It didn't matter the obstacles. I will get to Jesus because you think, how did she think she was going to get to him? It didn't matter. She was going to get there. You see, those who love Jesus like Mary did, nothing will stop them from getting to Jesus. She was so driven by her love, she simply had to get to him and then work out the details later. And this is what she does early in the morning. Again, I remember those that paralyzed, the friends that wanted to get the man to Jesus that was paralyzed. It didn't matter. How could they get to him? The crowd was so big, they couldn't get to him. And so they started thinking, nothing's going to stop me from getting to Jesus. We're going to get to Jesus. My friend is paralyzed. They got on the roof. They ripped a hole in the roof and they lowered their friend down to Jesus. Guys, we need hearts like this. We need a heart like Mary that says, I don't care the obstacle. I'm getting to Jesus. And I'm going to stay laser focused. I'll figure out how to do it once I get there. I'm just getting to Jesus. And also to say, you know what? I've got family and friends that are paralyzed by sin. They don't know God. They can't get to Jesus on their own. I'm going to take them to Jesus. And we pray for them. How do we get them to Jesus? We rip the roof of heaven open. And we begin to pray. And we lower them down in front of the Lord. Lord Jesus, I lift up my dad. I lift up my mom. I lift up my brother, my sister, my friend. You lower them in front of Jesus and say they're paralyzed. Heal them. And you trust in God to do that. Now, I know they have to make their own decision. I get that. But we have no excuse as believers for not ripping the roof of heaven open. And saying, God, you've given us the privilege of prayer. You've given us the privilege to come before you. Here I am. Heal my friend. This is the heart we need to have for other people. And this is the heart that Mary had. Nothing was going to get in Mary's way. She was going to get there regardless. And so the question is, is you know, how bad do you want to get to Jesus? How, do you want to get to Jesus bad enough? It's interesting. Yesterday, we had our, our men's uh, monthly prayer breakfast, if you will. A missionary, Bud Frey, was there. He'd served, I know that Jake mentioned him. He served in Africa for 30 years. He shared with our, friend, our men yesterday that there was a family that he had led to the Lord. They got saved while he was there. And they would travel to come Sunday morning miles, miles every Sunday walking to get to church. It wasn't like, you know, I don't know if I want to go to church. It's kind of a little bit cloudy today and I have to drive an extra five minutes because of traffic or whatever. They walked for miles to get to church. And he said they had to travel through a river to get over to where the church was. And I don't want to mis misrepresent him. Somebody can correct me later if I'm wrong. But it seemed to me he said that the river was something like 75 feet or 75 yards across. I know that's a long distance. But his point was they had to travel a long distance every time they came to church walking with their family through the river. And the mom would carry the kids, the dad would carry the kids, and they'd all walk through, you know, up to their waist or above and their chest or whatever. And he said one particular Sunday, it was storming like crazy, and the river was running hard, and it was very deep, and here they come. They're coming to church, and they're walking across this river with the water going really hard. He said it was up to their necks, and they're holding their kids up out of the water, and the mom and everybody's traveling across. They get to the other side, and he was like, my goodness. Guys, look, I appreciate your heart. I understand this is very, very great and all, but when it's this bad, he said it was still coming down. He said, when it's this bad like that, he said, everyone would understand if you weren't able to make it. And he said, no, no, pastor. He said, you don't understand. He said, when we made a commitment to Jesus, when I made a commitment to Jesus, I made a commitment with both feet in. That is, in other words, it wasn't a fair weather commitment. I made it all or nothing. And regardless of how high the water is or how difficult it is to get to Jesus, nothing is going to stop me. See, that's the heart of Mary. I'm getting there. It doesn't matter what the plan is, what the plan isn't. I'm going to get to the Lord. And Mary loved the Lord. And again, notice it says she went to seek him early in the morning. I want you to note the word early there. Proverbs 18, rather Proverbs 8:17 says this. 
I love them that love me, and those who seek me early shall find me. Two things I want you to note in this. I love those who love me. Does the Lord love everyone? Absolutely. The Bible says, for God so loved what? The world. That is even the unbeliever. The unbeliever. God loves everyone. So when God says, I love those who love me, what's he saying? He's not saying that he doesn't love everyone already. He's saying there's something special I will do in my relationship to those who seek me with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. If you seek me special, I'll be special with you. Again, Corey Tin Boom said it the best. God does not have favorites, but he does have intimates. And I believe the closer you want to get to the Lord, the closer he will get to you. The more you love him, the more he will love you. And guys, this is something I want you to grasp here. And I've been very, I think, probably too gracious and maybe too timid about this subject over the years because I don't want anybody to feel guilty. But here it goes. All through scripture, God says, I will reward those who seek me early. That means getting up when you're sleepy and seeking God. That's what the Bible says. It's from the beginning of the Bible all the way to the end of the Bible. It doesn't mean you're not saved if you don't. You are saved. It doesn't mean you're not going to heaven if you don't. You are going to heaven. It doesn't mean God won't hear you in the middle of the day or later. What it means is if you want that special manna from heaven, if you want closeness to God that other believers have and you desire to have it, if you want that intimacy that Mary had with Jesus, you're going to have to get up early. That's just how it is. So I'm going to be the one to tell you the bad news and step on some alarm clock toes and give you some alarm clock blues. How about that? That even rhymed. But the, because I love you and the Lord loves you. Listen, even the picture he gave in the manna in the wilderness, he gave the manna every morning. Get this. Those who wanted manna, they went out in the morning and they got the manna. It says those who didn't go out after manna till the sun rose, the manna melted away. What is the picture God's giving us? Get it while it's early because life starts and gets busy and you won't have time. But if you will seek me early, I will meet you early. I will meet you early. Look, I took God at his word this morning. I don't always do that. I'm going to give you a picture. I'm, I'm this perfect pastor. I always get up early. I don't. I fail a lot. And I don't, I'm not always consistent as I want to be. But I took God at his word this morning. And some of the things I'm going to share with you today, he told me for the first time this morning. He told me for the first time. Why? Because I took him at his word. He said, seek me early and you'll find me. I sought him early this morning. I found him. And some of the things we're going to look at today, he showed me today. After studying this week, I didn't see it. I get up and seek him. And I said, God, I'm taking you at your word. It's still dark. I'm here to seek you. You said you'll show me things. He said, watch this. And he did. And so that is the promise God gives. Again, I don't say that to boast about how spiritual. I've shared my weaknesses. I say that to let you know I've tried him and I've tested him. And you know what I found? He's true. He's true to his word. And if you want that intimacy and you want that closeness and you want God to show you things, you're going to have to rise early and do it. And I understand, again, I know that's hard for some, but the bottom line is, is the Lord wants you to know that because he wants that close relationship and that's the only place you're going to find it. Not that you can't be close. I want to be careful on that, but you're going to be as close as possible if you rise early. Mary does it. She heads to the tomb and I love her heart because again, remember, she's waiting for the Sabbath to end. And it shows her love. She's so anxious to go. She's, the Sabbath has to end before she can walk back to the tomb. The Sabbath ends. She gets up as early as she can and heads off going after Jesus. And look, then she ran and she came to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved, that is John. And she said to them, they said to them they've taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they've laid him. So now she runs from here all the way over to the other side of the Temple Mount, up on the upper part of Jerusalem where they were staying there, no doubt in the upper room, or up there probably at Mark's mom's house, that different Mary. There are multiple Marys in the stories here. This is Mary Magdalene. They were staying over probably at Mark's mom or somewhere around there. She runs to tell Peter and John, the stone has been removed. Jesus' body is missing. But like the others, not even a thought of the resurrection comes to her mind because none of them understood at this point he, about the resurrection. She thinks the Jews or the Roman soldiers have taken the body somewhere else. It's interesting. I've heard people say, well, I believe probably the, the, the Jews or the Romans took his body away. The church, when Jesus rose from the dead, the first believers, they thought the Jews or the Romans had taken him away. The Jews and Romans said the, that the church took them away. The bottom line is God resurrected from the dead in the form of Jesus. He took himself away. And so notice what it says. Peter, therefore, went out and the other disciple, and they were going to the tomb. And so they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. Now, some people try to say that John's bragging here of the fact that he was faster than Peter, and he had to let us know that he got there first. Although that's kind of amusing, I don't think that's what's happening here. 
I think John is simply relaying the story of what happened so that you'll see the full picture. He's saying, look, I got there first. I didn't go in. Peter got there next. And look what Peter does. This is, first of all, John, verse 5. And he, that is John, he's speaking of himself, stooping down. Oh, by the way, I want him to see the tomb. Let's put the picture of the tomb. I last, not the last time, but the time before last, I took a shot of the tomb. And I shared with you last week why I believe this is the exact tomb. I'm convicted that it is. I'm not going to fight about it. We're not going to start the church of the believers of the tomb and on Golgotha or whatever, and then you can go somewhere else if you don't like it. We're not going to do that. But I believe this is where it happened, and I wanted you to see it while I'm reading the story. So this is where Mary runs. She looks in that door. She takes off back to get Peter and John. Now, they come running back to the same thing here to look at this. And it says, he, this is John now, standing outside that door, verse 5, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. Now, why didn't John go in? Probably for a couple of reasons. First of all, his culture. John had been raised from a little boy. You don't go near a tomb during the Passover. You don't go near a grave during a feast day. Never go near a grave or a tomb unless you have to do it because you become Levitically or religiously defiled, which means you can no longer take part in the rest of the celebration that week. And I can imagine his mom grabbing his little hand as he ran to go and look at some, stay away from there, you'll be defiled. The Passover starts tomorrow. Here's John now. As probably a teenager, most believe, he runs to this tomb because he wants to see what's going on, but probably stopping short there at the door just to make sure he doesn't go in and get Levitically defiled. Not that he doesn't love the Lord, but that culture and that religious upbringing, I think, kicking in. Secondly, he was younger than Peter, <coughs> excuse me, so no doubt he wasn't sure the best way to deal with the situation. So he stops and simply looks in, but he sees inside the tomb the linen cloths lying there, but the Lord's gone. Notice, then Simon Peter came following him. And look at Peter, like a bull in a china shop. Peter went into the tomb and he saw the linen clothes lying there. So John stops. Peter just comes right by him, right by that door, just boom, ball, piles on in there. Why did Peter have such boldness to run right on in? Because Peter already felt about as defiled as a man could be. If you remember just three days earlier, he had denied his Lord three times. There's nothing to be defiled about. I'm as defiled. I've, I've denied my Lord. How can it get worse? I just, I want to know what's going on. I mean, Peter, what was he doing? Was he looking for hope? What hope would he have found in that? He didn't yet believe in the resurrection. Was it more of curiosity? Was it more of nothing to lose because of how bad I've been or whatever the case might be? We don't know the exact motivation, but no hesitation on Peter. He runs straight in uh, and looks into the tomb, sees the clothes lying there. And notice verse seven, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, we talked about that one place that was open, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Now it's interesting that Peter not only saw the linen clothes lying there, but he saw the handkerchief they used to cover the face in a different place folded. And why would this be significant? Because what they were accusing was someone had stolen the body. Listen, here's the bottom line. This would have shown that someone was in the tomb, but whoever was in the tomb, they took the time to fold part of the clothes that were in there. And first of all, it was only men that went in up to this point and men never fold anything. So you would know this can't be a grave robber. This never would have happened. And so the, and again, the Roman soldiers, they wouldn't have done it. The Roman soldiers, listen, the Roman soldiers were there guarding it. Here's how serious it was for a Roman soldier. There was about 16, they worked in groups. And most scholars believe there was a group of 16 watching the tomb that day, in those three days. If that body went missing, if they ever dropped their duties of what they were supposed to do, they all were put to death, everyone executed. That means you'd have to fight through 16 Roman soldiers just to get the body of Jesus, which makes a grave robber highly unlikely. It would have been a small army that would have had to do it. And at the same time, uh, it wouldn't have been a grave robber because who would tidy up after themselves after they leave? And so again, um, to fold it, to put it there. This was something where Peter, I don't know what Peter was thinking, but Peter and John both perplexing. This is a very bizarre thing. The body's gone. The face cloth is folded. The Roman soldiers are gone. I mean, what's happening here? So you can imagine how their mind must have been at this point. It says, then the other disciple, verse eight, who came to the tomb first went in also and saw and believed. So Peter's in there, he runs by John, John goes in there next, they're both standing there inside, there's plenty of room to stand in there, I've been in there numerous times, you can see where the Lord was laying, and see where he would have been, you can imagine the, cloth, the linen cloths being there and being empty, and they're standing there staring at this, and wondering what's happened, where did the Lord go, uh, and he says he saw here, notice this, and believed. Now, 
most commentators, I'm going to disagree with here. So you can believe most commentators and say, my pastor's out to lunch. But I don't believe that he believed Jesus resurrected from the dead. That may change over time. Why do I not believe that? Because look at verse 9. He speaks of he and Peter and says this, For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. So if he believed, why would he say, yeah, but we didn't know he was going to rise yet? Again, it's not worth arguing over. He may have really believed that Jesus rose. But I think more than that, John's finally going, you know what? I don't believe that woman, but now I believe her. He really did get stolen. I think it was more of that. And we'll talk more about that next week, uh, the role of women and how women were looked, in that, looked upon in that day in relation to Mary and the other women that go to the tomb. They were not respected at all. They were not looked at very highly at all. Again, uh, the testimony of a woman was not even admissible in court. It was so bad in that day. And Jesus is going to change all of that. And the whole mindset and everything, again, that's next week, but we'll get to that when we get there. The point is, I think John was just saying, maybe didn't believe her. And now he sees this and goes, well, I guess she is telling the truth. I think really the body was stolen. Uh, and so, you know, he's, he's, he's gone, he's, he's in there. Uh, and again, they were blinded to their upbringing. Again, this is interesting to me because they said they didn't yet know the scriptures, yet the Bible tells us in multiple places that he would rise from the dead that he'd be crucified, that he'd rise again. But they didn't understand because they were raised in an atmosphere that taught that when the Messiah comes, he will rule and reign over the entire planet and he'll, he's never gonna die first. They ignored passages like in Isaiah and other places. They didn't describe that as their promised Messiah. And this is a problem I think a lot of us face and maybe some of you have this. I know I did when I first came to the Lord. Because of the way we're raised and the things we've been taught, it takes a while to really understand what the Bible's really saying. I know when I grew up in church, I, I was taught that Jesus wasn't God. There were a lot of things that I was taught. And suddenly when I began to read the Bible, I found out that Jesus very clearly is God and claimed that he's God and all these other things in Scripture, my mindset began to change. But remember, these are early believers. They've known the Lord now for three years. Some of them maybe not even quite that long, maybe a full three for all of them at this point. But the bottom line is, is this is why the, the rabbis had been teaching them different things. And now they're reading the Bible for themselves and they're learning what the Bible says apart from the rabbis again, which is so huge when you give your life to the Lord. So they didn't understand it. And look at verse 10, it says, then the disciples went away again to their own. Now it says their own homes, depending on what version you have. The word homes is not really in the original language. And the reason I leave that out, and I want you to be aware of that, is because they weren't anywhere near their homes. Uh, maybe only a small point, but I want it to be more accurate for you. They lived up at the Sea of Galilee. Their homes were up there. So what does it mean they went to their own? They went where they were staying during the Passover, which probably was the upper room, or staying there at Mary, Mark's mom's house, if you will. So they go back home, scratching their head, wondering what's happened, going back to stay again at the place they're staying. And that kind of ends the first little section here of the announcement that the body's been taken. Peter and John going to see what happened. And yet as Peter and John came back, guess who came back with them? Mary Magdalene. And now Mary Magdalene is going to stay there at the tomb because remember Mary, <laughs> you guys may walk off, you guys may be satisfied, I'm not. I'm finding Jesus. And again, this is where we get to see her love even more so. Look at verse 11. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping. You know, where's the body of Jesus? And as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb. Uh, again, she wasn't ready to take no for an answer. Uh, and again, she would have had concern about the Lord's body because in that day, uh, they would take bodies and abuse them, even as they will today for people that they hate in certain areas. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. Another gospel tells us there was a different group of women that came at a different time and they missed each other somehow in this crossing back and forth. Probably as she went to go get Peter and John, uh, it says they saw the angels as well, but they freaked out. They were like, they were like, you know, angels, right? I love Mary. She is so laser focused on finding Jesus. It doesn't phase her. It's like, there's angels there. Hey, Mary, why are you weeping? Oh, who are you? Where's the Lord? You know, it didn't even occur to Mary. Why are these guys in the tomb? And who are these guys? It doesn't even hit her again because her focus is not on angels or anything else. Her focus is on the Lord. And when your focus is on the Lord, everything else is secondary. I love it. Quite comical, actually. And then they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, because they've taken away my Lord and I don't know where they've laid him. Now again, again, comical here in the sense that Mary's talking to these angels and she doesn't even kind of say, who are you guys or why are you guys here? And, and are, you know, who are you? Are you angels? What's going on? Again, the focus being so clear on the Lord and the things of the Lord. But something else to note here, when she sees the angels, and this really jumped out at me this week, it's interesting that Jesus was buried 
in a linen cloth with angels on either side of him when he arose. Why is that significant? Well, to answer the question, we need some background. See, the high priest normally wore very ornate garments to do his duties. However, once a year, the high priest would, I guess if you call it this, dress down and put on only linen garments. Then he would go behind the linen veil. The veil that separated the Holy of Holies was a linen veil uh, to offer a blood sacrifice on the mercy seat of the ark of God for the people. And then he would come out and proclaim that their sins had been forgiven. And while the picture of the mercy seat best fits the cross where the blood was spilled, I believe there's a picture of the Holy of Holies in the tomb as well. I think God is showing us this holiness in the Holy of Holies in both the mercy seat of the cross and yet the Ark of the Covenant, if you will, Jesus Christ being our mercy seat, now forgiving us, now showing us mercy because here's what would happen. That is even as the blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat of the cross, by Jesus, our high priest, so too the place where Jesus rose is a picture again of our heavenly high priest in victory. How so? The high priest would enter the Holy of Holies, that is the earthly high priest, behind, note this, the linen veil, wearing only linen himself, and sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat with the angels on either side of the ark that is overshadowing it, later to leave the place declaring that all sin was forgiven. So to Jesus, our heavenly high priest, sprinkled his own blood on the mercy seat of the cross, entered the tomb behind the linen veil, so to speak, that was wrapped around him in linen, laid in the tomb with angels on either side, only to come out of the tomb at the end of it all saying, all is forgiven. Do you see the picture that God is painting here? And what really hit me again, one of the cool things that God showed me this morning for you, because he doesn't show me this stuff till you guys show up. But what was really cool was, is the Ark of the Covenant, I never realized this till God began to show me. And, I, and again, that's exactly how it was. The Ark of the Covenant was placed facing west to east or east to west with the poles sticking out. Now the poles didn't stick beyond the curtain, but you could see according to the rabbis and the priests, the poles in the curtain. So it was facing from west to east. When they buried believers in that day, they dug the tombs and they faced them from west to east, their head being on the west side, their feet being on the east side because they believed, rightly so, when the Messiah comes, when God comes to rule and reign, he's coming from the east in the clouds, which indeed he will. And when they resurrect, they all wanna be facing him. So they all rise up and they're facing the Lord when he comes back. It's really a beautiful picture. And although they're wrong about when he's coming back and about how he's coming back and he's already been once and left, they're right about that. And I realize when you look at the tomb and you see the way he laid from east to west and you think about the Ark of the Covenant, east to west, they're exactly parallel to each other in Jesus being our Ark and the Ark on the Temple Mount. And I'll tell you, I've never done the aerial, but now I'm going to. I wonder, I'm not saying it changes anything, but I wonder if the tomb is equal to where the Ark of the Holy of Holies was, even facing God, waiting for the return of the Lord. I don't know, but it gets even better. Because something else that, we, that God was really ministering to me about was, is what was inside the ark? Remember what was in the ark? The tablets, the word of God. What else was in the ark? The manna that was given from heaven. What else was in the ark? The rod of Aaron, the high priest. Guys, do you realize Jesus is the word of God? He is in the ark. Jesus is our manna from heaven, which was what was in the ark. Jesus is our high priest as Aaron's rod represented. God is saying everything's been fulfilled. Everything's been paid for. You now have mercy through the cross, by the mercy seat, by the resurrection. The veil's been torn. The linen's been ripped down. He's now come out. He's, he said all is forgiven and all who receive it can now have eternity in heaven with the Lord. The powerful stuff. It's exactly what, it, you know, again, this whole picture that he gives is so that no one can doubt and that everyone will know. And so, again, he sees, uh, she sees these angels here in white uh, sitting here, not knowing what's going on, not understanding. Them. Verse 14, and when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and didn't know that it was Jesus. So now you can see her. She's right there somewhere in that little area. She's looking in the door, talking to the angels. She turns around and right there in that lower area stands Jesus looking at her as well. And she doesn't recognize who he was. Now, the first thing to realize is it was dark. She remembers she had gone before the sun rose, so it was dark. But also we see that no one recognized the Lord uh, after he resurrected. They didn't recognize him differently, which tells me that his, his eternal body is somewhat different than his temporary body, which means that our eternal body will be somewhat different than our temporary body. And aren't you glad? I'm glad. I look at my body now and go, whoo, I want a new one. And maybe if you do these kind of things, you see the blemishes. I wish that wasn't there. I want to change that. We're always trying to do things by whatever we do. Listen, listen, enjoy the pizza. You got a new one coming. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying be unhealthy. I'm just having fun with that. 
but you're going to get a new body and it's not going to be like this body. And so again, to also take note of this, this is interesting to me. When Jesus rose from the dead, he didn't run to all of his enemies. You might think, well, Mark, why would he do that? Because I would have been tempted to. <sighs> hey, Pilate, ah! you're in big trouble, man. I'm alive. Ah! Show up to the Jews. Hello. I'm here. Ah! I mean, just think about it. That would have been like really fun. He didn't show up to those who hate him and his enemies. Who did he show up to? Those who love him and those who are seeking him with all their heart, all their soul, all their mind, and all their strength. That's who he shows up to. That's why the Lord's showing up to you this morning, because you love him. And if you're an enemy of the Lord or you don't know him yet, he's revealing himself to you so that you can become part of the family. And I'll give you an opportunity to do that in a moment. But it's interesting to me to see that the Lord reveals himself to those who love him. And guys, the question is, are we loving the Lord? Are we loving the Lord? Is Jesus revealing himself to you right now? I never hear from God. I don't hear anything from him. Let me ask you this. Are you loving him? Well, sure, I love the Lord. Okay, whoa, we can all say that. We all say we love the Lord. Look at your life. Get out a pad and pencil and find out what would show God that I love him. Well, I only watch that many bad things. And I only hang out with those people that I know don't love God. And I only... Is that what our list would be? Or our, and I'm not talking about works, but I'm saying if you look at your life, are you loving him? What is love? Are you showing affection? Are you showing emotion? Are you showing devotion? Are you giving yourself to him? Are you self-sacrificing for him? If you're not doing that, no wonder he's not speaking to you. No wonder he's not showing you anything. The Lord loves those who love him. The Lord reveals himself to those who diligently seek him. I love that he said, those who diligently seek me will find me. There's a diligence involved here. It's not a works. He's not trying to make us grovel. But it's, you know what, do you love me or not? And that's what the Lord is, is wanting us to know. And I think challenging us even this morning, rather than going to the people that don't love him and make them squirm, which I might kind of enjoy, the Lord's saying, no, I want those who love me and I'm gonna love them as well. That's how this thing works. And so... She turns, she sees that it's him. Look at verse 15. Uh, she, Jesus said, woman, why are you weeping? And whom are you seeking? And she, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, then tell me where you've led him and I will go get him. I'll take him away. It emphasizes in the language what Mary said was this. I'll go get his body. I'm going to go get him. I'll, I'll take it somewhere else. Just let me know where it is. Now, I had to think Jesus had to kind of snicker at this. Now, I don't know what he did, and I'm not going to try to just say for sure because I don't know, but as I live this scene out, I kind of see him going, you're going to do what? Here's what happened. Jesus probably weighed between something, I don't know, 160, 180, 170, I don't know, normal man of that size, by the size of the tomb that was carved out when they see his body. And then they put 100 pounds of ointment and perfume on him. He's now up to like 270 with all this stuff. And Mary goes, just tell me where he is. I'll go and get him. And Jesus is thinking, wow, I love you too, Mary. You must really love me. You could, it's dead weight, 270 pounds. I, mean, I, I, I don't know how Jesus said this. I don't know the way he said it. But look at verse 16. Jesus said to her, Mary. I wonder if she's going, I'll go get him. I'll pick him up. I'll get him. I'll bring him back. <laughs> Mary. And look what she does. She turns, she said to him, Rabboni which is to say teacher. And by the way, that was a higher honoring way to speak to a rabbi. It's only spoken of twice in all the scriptures, the gospels. Rabboni is used twice. The first time it's used was blind Bartimaeus. And boy, did he have a lot to be thankful for, right? He had received his sight. He could see now for the first time, Rabboni, look what you've done for me. It shows the love, the heart. Thank you. The Bible says those who are forgiven much love much. Those that are healed, they love the Lord. Not that we don't, but again, there's something that happens in the heart. Now Mary loving the Lord, being set free from seven demons, having a life, you know, that's worth something. God's rescuing her, saving her when probably nobody else really cared. He says, Mary, it's me, so to speak. And she says, Rabboni, it's you, and this is great. And so there's this whole restoration here. And what's neat about this is, notice this, although she didn't recognize his face, she knew his voice. Well, that wasn't it, but she knew that. <laughs> I feel certain that wasn't his voice, but. but she knew his voice. She recognized his voice. Why? Because listen to what it says in John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. So even if she didn't recognize his face, you know, sometimes Jesus comes to us in ways we don't recognize. Could this really be the Lord? And then all of a sudden we go, I think this is his voice. 
because his voice is different. I, this doesn't seem like a way that I would think he would speak to me, but I know his voice. I really believe this is the Lord. And you follow that because you trust his voice. Why did Mary so, know his voice so well? Because she spent so much time with him. And see, here's the key. We too should be spending so much time with the Lord in the word and in prayer that even when we don't recognize what's going on in the circumstances around us, we should almost always know his voice. And notice I said almost. That is, I realize that sometimes it's hard to discern the voice of God when we're overwhelmed. But in general, we should be able to tell. And although we don't really know how Jesus said this, again, I think that it was very much in a, just a loving, you know, she just, it revealed it exactly who the Lord was and what was going on. And it's interesting to see the difference of what Mary found when she went looking for Jesus and what Peter and John found. Note this. She found Jesus, they found it empty. What's my difference and what's my point? They had been told that he was gone, and when they went, they didn't expect to find him. Hence, they found their search empty and they left there empty. However, Mary, notice the contrast. She went to the tomb looking for Jesus, expecting to find Jesus, and nothing was going to stop her from getting to Jesus. And not only did she find him, she got to see angels on the way. What's the difference? They were expecting to find nothing but something empty, and that's what they found. Mary was expecting to find Jesus, and that's what she found. Here's my point. If you've come here today out of obligation or curiosity or religion, and you're thinking it's just going to be empty like every other church service I go to, God's not going to speak to me, and I hate this religion thing. How long is this guy going to talk? If that's what you're here, you're going to leave here just as empty as you walked in those doors. But if you're going, I've got to find Jesus. I don't need a pastor. I don't need my friends. They're, they're great. That's a good addition. I don't need a pep talk. I don't need any of that. I need Jesus because only he can do what I need this morning in my life. If you're here and that's your attitude, he will meet you in power, guaranteed. How he will do it, I don't know. What he will do, I can't say. But Jesus never fails. He never lets down and he's always true to his word. He said, if you seek me, you will find me if you seek me with all your heart. You draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. But if you've come or going, ah, let's get this over with and maybe we'll go to the lake or whatever you're thinking, there's nothing wrong with the lake, but you get my point, you're gonna leave here and you're not gonna get anything out of it. But if you're finding Jesus, if you're looking for Jesus, then again, you're gonna find the Lord. So what does that leave us today? Listen, as believers, number one, let's pray to God that God gives us a love that we used to have. If we've left our first love, let's come back. Let's love the Lord like Mary loved him. Let's have a heart that says, nothing will stop me from getting to you, nothing. You don't understand, it's very busy right now. The job's off of this and the wife's that and the kid's that and sports are starting and school's starting up. Really? How deep does the river have to be to stop you? How big does the stone have to be for you to say, well, we can't do it because of that? Are you going to say, look, I know we've got all that and I realize we're going to do it and I'm all in, but we're going to find Jesus. As a family, we're going to find Jesus and that's going to be number one. Everything else is going to fall second. You're going to find him and he's going to find you and you're going to see God do amazing things in your family. We need to pray for that kind of rededication and reheart this morning. Not works, love. Motivated by love. And if you don't know the Lord this morning and you've come here empty, the Lord wants to fill you now. He wants to fill you, but what you have to do is you've got to say, Lord, I'm here to find you. Reveal yourself to me. And he's probably already done that up to this point. He's shown you that he's real. He's working right now by his spirit. What you've got to do is confess your sin. Mary, what are you looking for? What, whom are you seeking? He would say the same thing to you. What are you looking for? Whom are you seeking? He wants you to verbalize it and say, Lord, it's you. I need to confess my sin. I need to ask forgiveness of my sin. And I need to seek you. I want to give you a chance to do that. And let's pray and do it right now. Father, I want to thank you, Lord, for the work of your spirit in us as believers. Thank you, Lord, for revealing yourself to us this morning in a new and fresh way, in a loving way, and renew our love. I pray for the believers in here first. Give us the love of Mary Magdalene. Give us the love, Lord, that first love we had when we first came to you, a new freshness, a new desire for you, God, a new heart for you, a new passion for you, Lord, a new drive for you. God, give us hearts that say, nothing will stop me from getting to Jesus, nothing. And if our hearts are hard, then God, I pray you would touch our hearts right now and soften them, roll away the stone from our heart. Give us a heart of flesh. God, hear our prayers right now. And if that's you around the room, pray it. God, give me a heart of flesh. Renew me, revive me. Give me my first love back. Let me be solely and totally devoted to you. Ask him to do it. He will do it. God, I pray if there's any here this morning that don't know you, 
And right now, the first time, God, they really say, you know what, this is real. I, I really believe this. I never did. You've opened my eyes. My eyes have been opened. I see the truth in this. I don't want to leave her empty like I came in. I want to leave her filled in the hope of heaven. If that's you, it's simply a matter of confessing. The Lord asked them to confess. Now you've got to do that. Here's what you do. Right now as you're praying, say, I know that I'm a sinner and I know that you died for my sins. On that cross, tell him that. Ask him to forgive you of everything you've ever done, all your sins, confess them to him. And ask him now to be your Lord and your savior and to save you and give your life to him. Father, I don't know what all you're doing this morning, but your spirit is always at work. God, complete the work that you've begun this morning. Do an amazing work in us as believers in that renewed love. And Lord, do an amazing work in those that don't know you, that they could come to know you for the first time this morning. Thank you for what you've done, Lord. This is real, it's not a game. We're not playing religion, Lord. This is real. You're alive and we're alive because of it. And this thing goes on forever. We thank you. We bless you. We praise you. And we give you all the glory. Now pour out your spirit, God, on everyone in here. Pour out your Holy Spirit and your grace. Fill us with your spirit. Fill us with your joy. And fill us with your hope, regardless of our circumstances. And turn our weeping into joy. We thank you, Lord. We bless you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. May God richly bless you guys in your study in the word and prayer this week. And tonight at six o'clock.